Well, as you can see, we're here uh, in Verona because the writer of this book says that a uh, little shaky here has been to Verona before. Well, have you? Is it true? Oh, he's not saying. Well, this man seems pretty convinced, so um, an idea where the toilets are. If, like me, you waste endless hours having slanging matches in comment columns about the Shakespeare authorship question, you will find that people will insist that you read this book. The Shakespeare Guide to Italy is written by Richard Paul Rowe. Derek Jacobi gives his approval on the front cover. Michael York and Mark Rylance are also fans. What Rowe says is that he has found evidence during his travels in Italy that the writer of the plays clearly went to that country. And he begins with Romeo and Juliet. At the beginning of the play, Romeo is languishing in a sycamore grove, pining for the love of Rosaline. The sycamore grove is not mentioned in the sources of the play, so it would be significant if he could prove that it had actually existed. His novel research method is simply to jump into a taxi and ask the driver to take him to the place. The section proving that he has found the grove is so short I can read it in full. The driver, with a proud sweep of his hand, exclaimed, Ecco, signore, there they are. It is truly here outside the western wall that our sycamores grow. And there they were indeed. Holding my breath for fear they might be mere green tricks of the sunlight, I leapt from the car to get a closer look at the broad lobe leaves and mottled pastel trunks to make absolutely certain that it was true, that the playwright had known and had told the truth. Benvolio was right, and I was no fool. Now the trees are in separated strands, the ancient grove cut and hacked away by boulevards and crossings, by building blocks and the ruthless crooks of urbanization. But the descendants of Romeo's woodland are still growing where they grew in Romeo's day, rejoined in the mind's eye, erasing the modern incursions. Those stands form again the groves that once four and far more centuries before was the great green refuge of a young man sick with love. If he was serious in his research, he might have counted the trees and worked out what proportion were sycamores. He might have engaged a forestry expert to tell him how old they were. He might have checked the town records for evidence of a sycamore grove on this spot. He might also have taken numerous photographs of this grove. Instead, this is what we get. This one looks like the Civic Centre in Wolverhampton. It really doesn't tell us much. And on this one, we simply have to take his word for it that the trees that we see through the gate are sycamores. As it happens, we can now use Google Earth to check his evidence. Anything here that stands out as a grove? The trees he photographs through the Porto Palio seem to be lining a road, not a grove then. There are trees in the Parco delle Mura, but from what you can see of them, I can't really identify positively any sycamores. And a scan through images taken in the park shows more poplar trees than sycamores. His research method then is as follows. One, ask a taxi driver to take you to Romeo's sycamore grove. Two, confirm that there are some groups of trees there and that at least one of them is a sycamore. Three, cross sycamore grove off your to prove list and bugger off in search of the next item. No need for further study. Seriously, this is about as convincing as Conan Doyle's fairy pictures. But let's stay with it. The next part of the book is more interesting and more complex. It concerns the castle in Villa Franca, known in the play and in the main source as Freetown. And the nub of Rowe's analysis rests on some lines from the beginning of the play. You Capulet shall go along with me, and Montague come you this afternoon to know our further pleasure in this case, to old Freetown, our common judgment place. The point he makes here is that on the evidence of these lines in the play, it seems that the castle at Villa Franca, or Freetown, was clearly a place of some significance, operating as a princely court and centre of legal activity, a place of judgments and pronouncements. What he doesn't do is to produce any evidence for this from outside sources. We have to take his word for it. There are no notes for this chapter, nor are there books in the bibliography that might provide this evidence. If you read Arthur Brooke's original narrative poem, it's obvious that this is a very important source for the play. Every nuance in the poem is reproduced in the play almost to the point of plagiarism. At lines 1974 to 1981, you'll find the following. Unless by Wednesday next thou bend as I am bent, and at our castle called Freetown, thou freely do assent to County Paris suit, 
and promise to agree to whatever then shall pass with him, my wife and me, I shall thee wed for all thy life, that sure thou shalt not fail a thousand times a day to wish for sudden death. This, of course, corresponds to the scene in the play in which old Capulet castigates Juliet for her refusal to marry Paris. The difference here is that Capulet doesn't just ask for her compliance. He wants her to consent to the marriage at our castle called Freetown. Now, as Roe asserts, the idea of a Capulet castle at Villa Franca, Freetown, outside Verona, was just silly. Yes, indeed. That's why it seems obvious that the hour in our castle refers to the people of Verona in general. But actually, regardless of which hour we are talking about, it's clear that the castle at Freetown is a special place, ensuring that if Juliet makes a promise there, it can't easily be rescinded. This would be true even if it were a Capulet castle. If we want to explain where the author got the idea that Freetown was a significant place, we need look no further. It's there, in the source document. So it seems it was not necessary for the writer to travel to Verona in order to infer the importance of the castle. And as it happens, the castle was actually abandoned in 1450, well over a hundred years before de Vere went to Italy. If he wanted to admire the buildings of the Della Scala family, he would surely be far more likely to visit their palazzo in Verona, rather than a crumbling, deserted edifice miles away from town. Besides which, assuming anyone had visited the place, well, they would have found only walls and ramparts. It seems very unlikely that any evidence of state rooms and presence chambers would remain, assuming they existed in the first place. So that's the first two points in Rowe's book. It truly is an entertaining read, and it clearly has the respect of some people far cleverer and more knowledgeable than me. So I'd be genuinely interested in hearing from people who know about this. Is it true, for example, that Villa Franco was a princely court where judgments were dispensed? I couldn't find anything that confirmed this. Please leave a comment if you have any information, and if you have been, thanks for listening. Well, that's it then. That's just the first two points of this book by Richard Rowe, beloved of anti Stratfordians everywhere. And to be honest, so far the evidence is looking a little shaky.